Thing Thursday. I am Ravi Tangri, and my guest here, Martin Nashkornik, and I are going to explore today this whole concept of trust and surrender. Uh, the, our society seems to build a whole lot more control freaks. People need to grab onto control, control everything. And sometimes that's actually to your detriment. And so we're going to dive into this. And what we want is we want to um, get some of your questions as well so that we can respond to that. So please feel free to jot those down in uh, the comments as as you, uh, you know, as, as you join in, as they pop up and, and we will respond to them. And what we'll do is maybe, Martin, I'll get you to introduce yourself first a bit, and then I'll, I'll introduce myself, and then we will uh, we'll dive into this, shall we? Perfect. Please do. Go for it. Absolutely. So what would you like them to know about you? Well, me, uh, I'm, yeah. There, there was once a song by Janice Stanfield, I'm not lost, I'm just exploring. And life sometimes feels like that, yeah. So I've been an explorer all my life long. I've been, uh, I, it's taken me to, to great, great places. I've I had the good fortune to, to study with Tibetan monks in India, Buddhist philosophy and, and things uh, that, and still then coming back, running a business and doing all that. And, and uh, you know, all this stuff that was basically shelved as highest philosophy, but not really practicable use in daily life. And so it only took me about 25 years to figure out how actually to use it in daily life. And so I'm running my business with this. I'm running several businesses. Uh, I'm a speaker and trainer coach. Um, we, together with my meanwhile ex-wife, I run a business to teach English to children. Uh, we run the Austrian branch of an international franchise. I dabble a little bit in graphics design and stuff. So this, I'm still exploring, but due to a big crisis in two years ago, three years ago almost now, uh, I had to learn to surrender. And that is where our conversation started and where, where we got to talk about this. And so, yeah, I'm still a proud owner of Monkey Mind. Uh, and we'll, I think we'll come to that a little bit later, what that is. And so, yeah, I'm a father of two beautiful kids. And, and they're, they're amazing. If I look at them, then I, I'm not worried for the future generation. <laughs> I'm just, just worried that we'll mess up the planet too much for them to fix it. Uh, but looking at them, there are some great kids coming to the planet. Yeah, just very briefly about me. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. And just for those who don't know me, I'm Ravi Tangri. And I, you know, I've got uh, two amazing stepsons and one son from scratch that uh, I, I share the same philosophy and just became actually a grandfather this week. So rock and roll. Um, the I find it really interesting, Martin, that you went and studied with the Tibetan monks in India. Uh, my, my background, it's, it's really interesting. I'm East Indian by heritage. But I've really never been drawn to the philosophy from that culture. I've explored many other spiritualities, um, but uh, the only part of my culture I've really kept is the food. So uh, the, it's, I find it fascinating that you brought that into the Western mindset. My background is a little bit different in that, uh, yes, I have explored different philosophy, spiritualities, but the, I also, my first career was as a quantum physicist. And that's where I really learned that how our consciousness actually impacts reality. Just simply observing an event changes it. Expecting a result changes it. And the interesting thing is there's a lot of work that's been found that shows that that impacts uh not just the quantum world, but but everyday life. And so my work has been, the third arm of that has been working in business, but has been bringing together the spiritual, the philosophical, the scientific, and the business side to say, how do these marry together so that we can live and work a whole lot more intentionally? And uh, like Martin, I've had some times as well where 
you know, it's, it's like there's nothing I can do. So I can either just sit here and freak out or I can really walk the talk and believe what I preach and trust uh, and, and, and surrender because there was nothing more that I could do. And those are huge, huge learning points. So that's, uh, that's where I'm coming from. And Martin and I had a really neat conversation a few days ago where this whole topic of trust and surrender came up and we thought, wow, this is something we can really dive deep into. And the three areas that I think we're going to get into today are, first of all, what is trust or surrender? Uh, why is it so tough? And then, because it's so hard, people are terrified to let go. And then how uh, do we actually do it? So Martin and I will share some ideas and thoughts and learnings that we have had. So that's a general flow. And as I said, please share your questions, type them into the comments, and we can respond to that. So. Martin, maybe you'd like to start off with your thought about trust and surrender. What the heck does that really mean? Does does that mean you just sit on a you know you sit on a beach and wait for everything to come to you? Yes, you know that's as, as the show in the secret. Yeah, you sit on your couch, you visualize the Mercedes, and it shows up on your doorstep. Isn't that the, how it works? <laughs> um, no, it isn't. Well, let me let me start somewhere somewhere else. Um, I think we, we all have, have been in states in our life where things just came together easily, just gracefully, just like, you know, you looked somewhere and something popped up and you just went, oh, this is exactly what I needed. And at other times, it's incredibly hard. You're fighting and you're struggling and you're persevering and still you're not getting the result. So where, where's the difference between the two? And the, the problem, why it's so hard to trust and to surrender is that in, in, for me, in, in my opinion, in our Western world, we are so conditioned on that we have to figure everything out and that we have everything under control. And that is, that is where we come back to what I said at the beginning about monkey mind. You know, this is a term that comes from actually Zen Buddhism from, from Japan. And where they say there's this instance in the mind that's constantly checking, constantly controlling, constantly making a story of things, criticizing, judging, evaluating. And in 99% of all cases, we made that part of ourselves the ruler, the master, and not the servant. Critical well, thinking. I think that's who they are. Is there Absolutely. To, to the degree that they think that's who they are. Exactly. I, I totally agree with that. And um, I, always, I always think, or the last three years, I, I, I usually think that the flow of life is inevitable. The crisis is optional. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, and I loved it so much when you said it in our, in our uh, podcast recording, the delusion of control. And I've, I've had a, a recently a, a, a German um, speaker, he put it so nicely. We, we perceive a fraction of the visible spectrum. We hear a tiny portion of the sounds that are possible. Uh, and still we think we have this all under control when we don't even perceive like physically, possibly, yeah? only a tiny fraction of it. And also then on top comes our monkey mind, our conditioned thinking, our reticular activating system and how all this, this psychological things are called, uh, filtering out information and just leaving it again, a tiny fraction of it. And still we think we got it all under control. Hmm. I wonder where the mistake could be. Yeah. So, and for me, in, in, this, in this situation of crisis, and, and of course, I knew all that theoretically yeah, and philosophically, and it's a nice idea. Um, but when the rubber hits the road, uh, we need an experience. And, and life, don't worry. I mean, life will show you. Life will give you a chance to experience. And usually, we don't get it at the first time. When, when life tries to show us something and we just say, no, no, I've got this under control. Not just fix, perse persevere a bit more. Right? 
And work harder. Work harder, right? This, this is, and yeah. So it's, it's especially true in in the creative industries, yeah, like advertising and so on. You have to work harder to get better ideas. Hmm. And there, it's pretty obvious that it's not that case. But in in so many other things, we think we we can do that. And so, I think we have to we have to think we have to come to one place, and and that place is. We have to decide whether we want to treat everything as an as a coincidence or nothing. And and Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it so nicely. He says one is an incidence, two is a coincidence, and three is a series. Yes. And well, this really this really made made sense to me. This is so it's actually true. The coincidence is not an accident. It's a coincidence. It's something happened again. And and I, I really like that. And and I'm. And life is usually giving us signs in, in terms of series. You, you know, you, you run across an, an, an old uh, friend that you haven't seen for 10 years, and two weeks later, you run across the same person again, and three weeks later, again. I mean, I think that's a series. That's a clear sign. Talk to that person. There's something going on. You, you're in the same field. And I don't, don't need to talk about fields uh, to a quantum physicist. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so there, there is... And, the thing is, if it's if there are no coincidences in the accidental sense, where are we going with this? So we have to come. We have to come to the to the conclusion. Do I trust that there is a higher intelligence involved in all this, whatever you call it? Yeah, you call it life or universe or God or I, I don't I don't care frankly. As whatever whatever is, one of my teachers, Tapas Fleming, uh, she who taught me a. a a technique to release stress. Uh, she called it so nicely what makes the flowers grow. Yes. And I, I really, I really like that. And so whichever it is, but uh, so, and as Einstein said it, do you believe that this universe is a benevolent one? So this, this is a basic decision that, that you have to make. And, and, right. And this will shape, I mean, simply from a, from a standpoint of, of, of psychology, it will shape how you perceive the world and what you will perceive in the world. Yeah? We all know the, the old examples of you buy a new car and half the time drives the same thing, or it's like your, your wife gets pregnant or, or your sister or whatever, and suddenly you see pregnant women all over. And neither there was a sales record for that car nor a fertility boom. But it's just suddenly your perception was sharpened on that. And if you think that life is out to get you, well, guess what? What you will see. In, That's in what you'll find. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, that's what yeah. I find. That's amazing. Is that uh, you know the the way the the principle you know the popularized term is the the law the law of attraction, uh, the, the way that yeah. it laid out. Uh, people who don't believe in it actually apply it to create their reality that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> which exactly. is an interesting exactly. thing that you know th this whole thing about um we get you know stuck in our monkey mind and i talk about how we you know we think oh my god if we work hard enough if we think hard enough if we analyze it enough we will be able to make our way through and you know how much how often does that really happen you, you know and and it really is a delusion because um what I, I found is that if you, re I'm a scientist still, okay, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And if you approach it scientifically and look through your history and look at all those times when you worked and worked and worked and did so much, how many times was it that you made everything happen or that something happened that was totally out of your control that allowed you to get to where you wanted to be. It's pretty much always that way. And, and it's kind of funny in that a big part of my work is strategic planning with organizations. They want control and this and that. But I mean, a really good strategic plan, you can't define actions more than three months out in, in an operational plan because so much is gonna change, stuff's gonna happen. And you have to dance in that uncertainty. And that that's exactly. that's why, but people seem to think that they're so scared of that uncertainty that it's like. Well, because it, the world is out there to get them. Sorry? The world is out there to get them. That's interesting. 
Yes. Yeah. The so, world is my enemy and we have to control it to make everything fit. Yeah. And in that perspective of where you said Einstein asked, is there a benevolent universe? The way I look at it, is, the way I talk about it is that there's two ways of looking at the world. One is that, oh, I'm a poor, helpless victim and this tornado is taking me away. Or you have a trust that at some higher level, you, some higher intelligence, whatever, created the tornado to take you where you could not otherwise have gone. And yeah. I have no proof, no validation, but the second one just feels right. And the first one feels like a terrible place to live. And I mean, the, the thing is, um, the tornado is happening anyway. Yeah, if, if we stick with that, if with mm -hmm. that met metaphor. It's happening anyway, but how are you observing it? What are you bringing in onto it? Are you seeing it as an opportunity or as a threat? And of course, there, there are things that are, that are more difficult uh, in life than others. And the, what, what I found so important is, is that we have to, many people are so afraid to look in their own dark corners. You know, in, in the, all the the suppressed emotion and and the anger and and the what 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 Jung calls so so wonderfully the shadows, mm -hmm. the stuff that's triggering us from others, and and these will form the way we see the universe, and these will form the way we react to the things that are happening in this universe. Yeah, and and therefore, if if we change our reaction, you know, that's, it just, you just need to have an, even if you have like an, an electrical, uh, like diagram of, of, of the flow of electricity, you, you flip the switch once and you'll get to a totally different place. And so what if your attitude is one of constantly switching to a place of ease and grace and of, of, of just flowing with things and, it, I, I really liked it in our preparation. You said, okay, well, what about planning? Don't we have to make plans? I mean, you, if you say you work with strategic planning and sure, monkey mind loves to make plans. The question is, where do the plans come from? Do the plans come from ego and said, okay, society says that I should and I must and to be a good citizen, one has to or to be a good son or a good daughter or a good parent or whatever. Yeah. So are we shooting all the time? Or is it something that, that where the silent voice of, of our, our inner certainty comes through and say, okay, this is the right thing to do. And, and I've, I've had so many, so many places now in the last year where life took me to places I couldn't have fathomed that before. And yeah. even when the opportunity came up, then I was like, Okay, how is that now going to unfold? And right. Then so, suddenly, and I said, okay, then I, 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 I let monkey mind go. I sent him back to the corner. I said, no, you don't have to know how it's going to unfold. Thank you, life, for showing me. That's hugely hard for people who live in that space, right? But you know, what you've identified here is there's another piece to this. It's not just, you know, you trust and you surrender and you sit back and you go, la, la, la. Um, you have to be able to catch. I, I love what you said about, you know, it, it's like the fence posts that are coming along. That's the metaphor you use. But it's, it's about learning to access your intuitive voice. That's the, the other missing piece here so that you know when and what to do. And quite often that people are so busy with the monkey mind, they cannot hear that inner voice. They cannot see those fence posts when they come because they're so busy analyzing everything right. that um, all of that, the, 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 that intuition is the quiet voice within and you cannot hear it if, you're, if your head's going a thousand miles a minute. Exactly. And you have to create the space for that to come through. And why, if, if you think, if you talk to people who are really in, in like who had major breakthroughs, who had great revelations, um, did they come from the grindstone 
or did they just pop up suddenly when they were in the shower or when they were ironing or washing the car or just taking a, taking a morning run? And suddenly that idea popped into their mind and said, oh, yeah. And that is exactly that silent voice that you talked about, that, that can only come in when we get monkey mind to shut up. And, and the beautiful way for this, I mean, of course, ask a Buddhist uh, is meditation. Uh, or what I also love to do is energy work. Um, and so for all those people who say, okay, well, but this is not proven, this is not scientific and so on. Uh, I think there is nothing unnatural or supernatural in this world. Okay. Now here's where I'm going to take some exception to this. Okay. Uh, this is the scientist speaking. <laughs> uh, I think you can be absolutely scientific about this because even people who say they don't have intuition, they, you know, when something goes wrong, they always say, Oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Or I knew I should have done that. Right. But I didn't do that. So yeah. they have intuition. They just didn't listen. So this yeah. is what I talk to people about. Like, no one can trust or surrender or trust their intuition just because you or I say so. They've got to make the choice for themselves, right? Absolutely. And so there's this really simple way to scientifically validate your intuition. And what I suggest is you keep a logbook, keep a journal. Um, uh, and uh, what... Uh, what you do is every time there's a decision, whether it's big, whether it's small, you write down what the decision was, what that gut feeling said that you should do, and what you did. And then as time goes on, you write down what happened. Mm -hmm. So you can start to correlate whether it worked or didn't uh, over time. And for me, I did this. And, you know, there wasn't any gray at all. It was black and white, 100%. Every time... I ignored my intuition, even if I was doing the logical, rational, best analyzed choice. Oh. Kaka happened, I could not have predicted, and it blew yeah. up in my face. Every time yeah. I followed my intuition, even if it was the stupidest, most idiotic, most ridiculous thing, somehow it worked out. Oh. And, you know, uh, so for me, that was enough for me to validate it. And that's that scientific method to apply it to, is there a correlation between intuition and how it works? And that's really simple, yeah. a simple way that anyone can validate their own intuition. And, and you know, the, I think this is very hard for, for people in our, in our westernized society. But what, what I like to tell them is um, go to a place of gratitude and go to a place of not knowing admitting that you don't know going to the place of saying okay i don't know thank you life for showing me thank you universe angels god whatever whatever that higher intelligence is uh, sort of like say okay i'm too daft show me yeah, i don't get it please show me and then wait for what is going to happen wait for it for a sign and, and i've i've heard I've heard of, of amazing stories. Like a, a friend of mine uh, who was uh, like 20 years ago thinking of should she go change it, totally change the direction of her business and her life. And she went to a big retreat place and, and went to an event uh, that was unrelated to that business. And she said, okay, well, um, I, don't, I really don't know. I define signs. And one was an angel. Uh, so there will be an angel showing me. Uh, and you know, in, on the th second or third day of that event, suddenly a person tapped her on their shoulder and said, somebody she, she didn't know at all, and uh, said to her, you know, I, I have this little, little, uh, what do you call it, uh, pendants yes. that, that you can put on your, neck, on your necklace. Yeah. And um, for some reason, I thought that you need to have it. And guess what it was? An angel, of course. It was an angel. Exactly. <laughs> so how can that happen? And if people say, oh, well, this is woo-woo. And, and, uh, no, I, and as I said before, I don't think there's any supernatural. There's just something that we have not understood the scientific law to it yet. 
And I think that, that a lot of times you get people, you know, the, the, the people are concerned because they get these scientists and doctors poo-pooing all this stuff, right? But the fact is there is a lot of scientific evidence that supports all of this. They are not, it's just like you said, it's their reticular activating system will not allow them to see it because they right. that is their belief system. The thing you have to realize is these, I mean, I, when I was a physicist, I would taught pre-med students and head students. And my God, it was, I mean, I'm not meaning to diss doctors, but I'm sorry, it's its types of thinking. And they just simply could not forget infinite dimensional mathematics, which is how the universe right. works. They could not handle yeah. three-dimensional calculus. The they, they brains could not, they would work. That's why, because, but they're trained that way. Med school is memorize and do multiple yeah. guess exams, right? So these people are not responding as scientists and doctors. They're responding as scared human beings whose perceptions of reality yeah. is being challenged. And you have to realize that. And they're using their position to exert authority, which is uh, which is totally invalid. Uh, the, the, if you are open, a true scientist does not, does not dismiss something. A true scientist says, you know what? I don't know. There's no evidence one way or the other. Let's validate it. Let's do something. That's what a real scientist does. And there's huge amount of evidence out there that does support a lot of this. I mean, it, it, quantum yeah. physics, where I come from, and and the grand unified field theory. I mean, there's so much th to the universe people don't realize. Everyone knows about electrons, right? That's a fundamental particle of le electromagnetic energy. Uh, there's four separate forces in the grand unified field theory. And gra electricity, electromagnetic is one of them. Gravity is another. So just like the electron is the basic um, particle of ele electromagnetic force, in in for gravity you have something called the graviton in order for gravity to happen for me to have this pen and drop it uh the gravitons have to travel between the pen and the earth do you know what the size of a graviton is it's the size of a school bus these are virtual particles that do not exist until you look for them and then they appear. We haven't yet. Science has not yet figured out how to observe a graviton. But in order for gravity to work, in, for, in order for you and me to stick to the Earth, these school bus sized particles have to travel between you and me and the Earth. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any school bus sized particles lately. And yet that's what science says. But people who are, who are Newtonian, who are stuck in... It's got to fit in a box and I've got to analyze it with my monkey mind. They, they, it's not, I'm not, don't mean to be derogatory, but they, 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 their brains are not trained to think in those ways, to perceive in those ways. And it's hard for them to understand those concepts. And we've got to realize that these aren't, they're not speaking as scientists. They're not speaking as doctors. They're speaking as scared humans beings yeah. who, who are threat, feel yeah. threatened. And as, as, we, as we said, uh, the reticular activating system is shaping what we actually perceive. This is, this is, I always call it the general secretary in our brain. Because if, if we were to evaluate all the, the nerve, only, only, all the nerve signals from our body, we would, be, we would go nuts in, in uh, half a second because it would be way too much to, to, to calculate. Right. And so the, the question here is really, and, and I want to, want to bring it back to a, to a practical level. What can people actually do with this? Uh, so the, the reticular system is actually forming what we are perceiving out there. It's, it's, it's showing us, um, and this is, the, this, is the, this is our world. It's not that world. It's our world. It's the world that we have created by our thoughts, by our beliefs, by our habits. And... The, the, the huge thing is for me, get into a place, uh, trying to change this by willpower is extremely <laughs> exhausting. And it's impossible. extremely strenuous, and, and if not virtually impossible, right? So what, what we can do is change those habits tiny bits at a time. Create new habits and don't get upset with yourself if the new habit doesn't stick immediately. I mean, if you are fearful all your life, you, if you have been fearful all your life, uh, how do you want to switch to optimistic in a, in a day? 
it will not work. But find places of seeing what's right in the world, seeing what is working, and uh, re-emphasizing and consciously noticing, consciously noticing more and more and more, and it, you will turn the super tanker of your subconscious brain into a new direction. And you don't have to you don't have to push anymore in that direction, but it will pull you automatically there. So, and for that, in, in my opinion, uh, there there are two two things that are of of other importance. Find places of gratitude as often as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so, see things that are beautiful and and affirm this and say, "Oh wow, this is beautiful. I want to see more of this." And or it, or this was a beautiful interaction between this mother and this child. Uh, how wonderful that this is in the world. And because this will create imprints in your reticular activating system and, and leading you to see more of that, those. Yeah? And the other thing is to really get in touch with the dark side. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so not in a sense of becoming bad, but facing reality facing where you are stuck, facing what, what is triggering you. And if you get upset about the slow traffic moving in front of you or uh, the, the impossible person at, at, the, at the meat service in the supermarket, right, all those are signs. It wouldn't trigger you if it had, you hadn't some of that in you. And uh, the, the one, of, one of the technologies that I, I really use on a, almost on a daily basis is something called TAT. It's, it's tapas acupressure technique. And uh, some, some people know a technique called tapping or EFT. Uh, there, there, are, there are different modalities out there. Find one that is nice and good for you. Find one that you feel comfortable with. The work from Byron Katie is something that I like very much. It's, oh, that's amazing. And it's so it, simple. Just it's Google so simple to apply. W-O-R-K by Byron Katie. And the work. Find yeah, online, or, you find all you need online for TAT is is TATLife.com as uh, the work of Tapas Fleming, which is which is basically you holding acupressure points, and it looks a little bit strange, but it has a total total purpose. And it is you go through a nine step protocol of of acceptance and forgiveness and healing. And I've been I've been doing this and when I had no other choice anymore, and that was in this place of crisis in, in, three years ago. And by doing this, I found actually that when I, when I did this process, I was more at ease. I was more in balance. I was more in, in, in acceptance of what is there, and I could see more possibilities. And so what I, what I want to implore you, okay, you don't have to wait, wait for your deepest crisis to hit. Just start with something already today when, it, when it's easy and when it's, it's – and, and as I said before, you know, the flow of life is a given. The crisis is optional. Yes. So, yeah, if we get into this, the, the, the how to trust element, some of the things we've already talked about, the, the, the learning to trust your intuition, I already shared about that. Prove it to yourself scientifically with the, with the journal, right? Uh, right? You talked about meditation. Now, that's not for everyone immediately, uh, okay. but it's to find your own practice of mindfulness where you can step away yes. from monkey mind. I mean, people... Uh, uh, have difficulty understanding this, especially in, in some circumstances. But for me, one of my practices in mindfulness is dance. Uh, mm -hmm. When I'm dancing, I cannot think of anything else. I have to be fully present with right. my partner, with the music, and what's emerging, what, what am I co-creating and, 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 and choreographing. People have difficulty when they see a dynamic dance like salsa or whatever and say, how the heck can that be mindfulness? Absolutely it is because you are fully present and your monkey mind isn't going, oh my God, what do I do? What should I do? What about that meeting? Blah, blah. It's gone. You cannot operate in that way. Because but you it's go to an automatic mode, right? Yeah. Runners talk about getting to some sort of a runner's high, right? So, mm. so find the mindfulness that explore, try different things. The more you can quiet your mind, the more you can access that quiet voice within. You, the, the, the method I said about uh, trusting your intuition with the journal, you can apply that to looking through your life and seeing, you know, go through life and and, and look at all the things that happen and all the times when you try to control things versus when stuff happened, you could never have made happen. I had one of those crises, you know, some of those crises happened that you spoke as, as well, that, you know, there's no way 
I, I could have made any of it happen. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, once I, I remember I got a call from a <clears throat> global pharmaceutical company in Kansas or somewhere. The person who called me could not remember how he found out about me, but he absolutely knew he had to have me work with their executive team. And a week later, I'm in Belgium working with them. Uh, what could I have done? None of my marketing is trackable to that. And yet it just, yeah. you know, it's uh, the other thing in terms of monkey mind, there's, there's, a, there's a modality that I found very useful called access consciousness. And one of the simple tools they have, they talk about how all these thoughts that go on in your head, I mean, depending who you read, there's 60,000, 90,000, you know, 900,000 thoughts a day. It doesn't, doesn't matter. The thing is probably 99% of them are the same ones you had yesterday. It's just on a loop. But what Access says is that almost all those thoughts, 99% of those thoughts aren't yours. You pick them up from others. Mm. You, uh, you uh, pick them up from people around you. So there's a really simple uh, thing that, uh, that, that they've tool that they've got is when you've got, when every thought that pops into your head, you can ask, okay, who does this belong to? And if you get a sense of lightness, and sometimes the thought just goes away, or, and it's for feelings too, that means it's not yours. If you get a mm. sense of heaviness, which hardly ever happens, it's yours, and there may be some other work. Mm. But if you yeah. get that lightness, all you say is return to sender, and it goes away. And, it is like it's like that simple. So if you do that for three days, you will be amazed the stillness that you get. Like, who does this belong to? Oh, yeah. return to sender. Okay. Yeah, I totally. I, I totally agree. And and the the beauty of the beauty of this is um, that there are two sentences that there are two questions that I usually always ask. And and the, the one one is a quote by Byron Katie, and she says, "Don't believe everything you think." <laughs> yeah, that, that ties exactly into that what what you today. Yeah, th this is this is uh, and when when we get this notion of actually observing our thoughts. Yeah, is because normally our thoughts are, are autopilot. They're total total triggers. Yeah, I think it, therefore it must be true. Therefore it is. And if we can, if we can get the in in there, if we can get a wedge in there, uh, to say, okay, hang on. As you just said, who does this thought belong to? Yeah, or do I have to believe this? Is this, let's call it divine thought, or is it ego mind? Is it monkey mind speaking? Yeah, trying to figure out stuff again, which you can't figure out because we have not seen the result yet. Mm -hmm. And so this this is the one thing. So this is the, this was me extremely helpful. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't have to believe everything that I think. Okay, a thought appears, but just as my my BS detector goes on when I when I read something out there, we also should have a BS detector for what we think in our mind. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And and the other the other quote is is a quote from a course in miracles, and it says. It's a question: Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <laughs> and, yes. And I like I like this because being happy means that you are in one of four states: you are in love, appreciation, gratitude, or joy. Yeah. And that leads to inner peace. Everything else is being right. Everything else is saying, "Oh, this should not be this way. This must not not be this way. This is unfair. Uh, how can she treat me like this? How can he treat me like this?" And so on, and so on, and so on. And right. so whenever you and monkey mind loves to be right. And, and Susan you know, uh, is saying here, the ego speaks and, first and loudest. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and, you know, I had, I had once a coaching client and she said, no, I, I don't have to be right. I just want that. He knows that he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, right. Yeah. I think we have to still talk a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was that was that was so so <laughs> hilarious. So therefore, this this and and you said something very important about the dancing before, and this this is this is because we are so separated from our bodies, and that's why I love the 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 TAT also the tapping because it includes the body. It brings back our wholeness into the conversation, and this is this is something that is so so important. We we are so out of touch with our with our bodies that it's. It's it's crazy, yeah. And dancing 
is, is one modality that brings you right into it. You have to be there fully present in your body. And uh, so, you know, so many, or just, just one thought, uh, so many massage therapists say that when they are massaging people, suddenly some grief comes up or some, some, some emotion come up uh, that, that people were suppressing or were not aware of even uh, of what it was. And I said, oh, how did that come about? Well, because there is a body-mind correlation and there is a, a connection between the two. And if we exclude our body from our lives all the time and we're just thinking and trying to check everything out with our brain, uh, that won't work. Totally. I mean, most people live from here up. Yeah. And, and I think it's not just dance. I think all mindfulness practices, meditation, everything brings you into your body. Because what's one of the simplest ways to meditate? You focus on your breathing. That's your body, right? It brings you into, and the only thing that's real is now. And so it's, so, it's about, I have I have a slight problem with that. Okay. And that said from a Buddhist who's been spending 30 years in meditation. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not all the time, but occasionally. Um, the, I'm, where I'm coming back to the shadow work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, so, it's so easy to meditate on the good things and ignore the stuff that's bothering you or that's, that, that you don't want to face and so on. So meditation is a great tool to create this space of mind but it's also it can be also a great tool to deny stuff. Right. Now the thing is when you're saying on the good things or what is is there not a distinction between meditation and contemplation? Well, cuz you contemplate things such as the good or the shadow side, but mm -hmm. for me meditation is there's no thought, right? You're just you're just in the moment, in the present. Yeah, uh, th that, well, there, there are a whole lot of different ways of, of meditation, but yeah. the most simple, the most simple form of meditation is just watching your breath, for example, mm -hmm. is, as you said. Yeah? So this is a very simple way. And what, what, in my opinion, this does, it, it comes and it creates a distance between you and the, and the, the thought or the emotion that's there. Yeah. Uh, still. I, I see. I've, I've seen. I've seen enough people practicing twenty years of meditation, and still having the same relationship trouble, still having the same financial trouble, still having the same health issues. So that's the shadow part. That because if it that's keeps the going up, it's ignored. It ignore. Yeah, yeah. It's not so that other person. It's so it's it's not just that one thing is the cure at all, but we have to we have to. We have to look at it as a whole. As it is not, it's either the brain or the body. It's to get the both working in correlation, to work them in, in, okay. in union. Yeah. So, and we have to integrate all those things. And, and I think this is this is of, of so important, of so, such a big importance uh, that that we get real. Um, and we are, you know, what what I see so much in our society is that people are so in denial about their emotions. We don't talk about emotions here. We don't do emotions. Uh, uh, we, do, we, uh, we don't go into grief. We don't, you know, oh, well, what, what was in the past is in the past and leave it in the past. No, it will not stay there. So it I don't know about Austria, but in America, North America, one third of people, pretty close to one third of people have mental health challenges. And I think part of it is from that. Absolutely. That we don't have that ability to deal with the, all of that emotional, the mental health, all of that stuff yeah, in our yeah. society. Yeah. I've, I've just recently seen a, a great documentary. It's called Heal. Uh, called, uh, sorry? Heal. Like healing, heal. Yeah, H-E-A-L, yeah. H-E-A-L, yeah. And there was a lady, I don't know whether she was a doctor or something, but she researched radical remissions. Where, where cancer just disappeared, and she she, she uh, focused on she she traced thousand five hundred cases of radical remission, and uh, she conducted uh, several hundred interviews. I think two hundred fifty or so, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyway, so a lot, and she she found that there were nine things that all those people did in common, and. The, those nine things, only two were physical related. One was a radical change in diet, 
And the other was that they started taking some sort of supplement. Yeah, so boosting boosting the, the nutrients that their body got. But all the seven others were all related to lifestyle issues, uh, mental, physical, uh, mental, psychical choices they made, shadow work they did, uh, yeah. and, and stuff like that. So there's there's a huge, huge thing. And, and, and for me, it totally confirmed uh, that we have to deal with all the suppressed emotions in our lives. It's, it's a huge issue. Otherwise, you will not be able to get into the flow because well, your, your ego will trick you again and, and, and you will go in, into fear mode or you go into, into denial mode. And when you are in one of those modes, I mean, in order to surrender, in order to trust, you have to be open. You have to let go of the attachment to the outcome. Yeah. And you can't do that if you're in fear mode. Well, and the thing is, if you do not deal with them, those things are going to come up over and over and over again. People wonder, you know, why am I always running into the same sort of relationship drama? Why do I run into the same turkeys at work? Well, guess what? That's the universe saying, you, hello, there's something to look at still. You got some work to yeah. do. Yeah. So totally. Martin, I think you and I could go on for hours here, but we should probably yeah. start to <laughs> wrap this up. Uh, for yeah. those of you who want to um, find out more about Martin, you can um, go to his website, uh, martinlashkolnik.at, at, and uh, all of the information is there. You're based in Austria, of course, but yes. you you travel all over yes. the world for your work. Yes. And uh, the... Uh, so, you know, that's where you can find out more about Martin. And for those of you who are working on goal setting, on visioning, one thing that I can offer you, I've got a free one sheet on the seven biggest mistakes people make, which includes trying to control and over analyze the path um, uh, and how to avoid these mistakes. Uh, if you just go to metia.com, M-E-H, the number two, Y-E-A-H.com, and uh, you can download it for free there. Uh, Martin, thank you. This is, we're going to have to do this a little more often, I think. So I think it was we an absolute pleasure. On forever and ever and ever. This has been an absolute delight. Likewise. What a joy. Okay, have a great uh, week, folks. For me, I'm in Canada. This is Canada Day weekend. It's going to be amazing. Gorgeous wow. weather here where I am for the weekend. And you have a wonderful weekend, Martin. Yes, thank you very much. Bye-bye.